Okay, so uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, ICE 40 FPGA because I've been working with them uh, uh, quite a bit uh, lately and I thought it'd be a nice introduction. Um, so it's going to be very quick just showing off some of the things I've worked on uh, without too many details, uh, I mean, depending on which thing. Um, hopefully to give you the taste to actually try and, and work with them, or if you have any question on any specific project that I will present, just um, ask and, uh, and I'll try to, to answer them. Uh, it is mostly uh, basically a series of pictures, so I'm going to be just commenting on them. Uh, so a first quick, uh, introduction to the ICE-40 family. Um, I like them because they're really uh, small. Um, this is uh, the UP5K or the ICE-40 Ultra Plus uh, 5000. Um, which is one of the largest one. Um, by ultra plus, they mean ultra low power, uh, which means it's slow. That's a translation. Uh, so don't expect, you know, Arctic or or or, 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 or exciting levels of performance stuff like that. Um, you know, the the frequency we're talking about here is uh, you know 50 to 100 megahertz or stuff like that. So getting your logic to to be clocked at several hundred megahertz is not um, something you're going to achieve there. Um, not without a lot of care, at least. Um, another reason I like them is they're fairly easy to use. Like you don't need you know, 10 voltage rails, you just need uh, the IO voltage that you use, 3.3 volt, then the V core, which is 1.2 volt, and it's being low power, um, you can actually just use a linear regulator, and that works just fine. The the first board I designed for the ICE-40, I didn't know what kind of power consumption it's going to have, so I, I put like a, a switching mode power supply capable of providing like one amps, and um, I did a test design, uh, basically toggling every flip-flop in the FPGA at 100 megahertz while overvolting it, and it was consuming like 40 milliamps or something. So yeah, there was kind of quite a bit of margin so there. Would say that it didn't even reach the minimum consumption of the uh, actually, it, actually, the the, the the switching converter has a special low power mode, and it never leaves the low power mode, like the discontinuous conduction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a TI. Uh, <laughs> Um, and they're available in a, this one is particular it's available in a QFN 48 package which means it's you know fairly easy to solder um, at home without big equipment you, you, even just a soldering iron is, uh, is enough to, to solder it uh, that's the general uh, oh we that's the general structure of the UP5K uh, it has a bunch of uh, hardware IP uh, so it has uh, two SPI cores and two I squared C cores uh, which you can use. Uh, they're really meant to be used from a like a soft core CPU inside it because they have a bus interface, uh, you know, with um, registers and stuff like that, like you'd find in a normal microcontroller, basically. Um, something else interesting it has uh, are those SPRAM blocks. So it has one megabits of um, uh, SPRAM stands for single port RAM, um, which is fairly unusual in smaller FPGA to have that many, uh, that much SRAM uh, present uh, on them. And it's really useful to have it on board, basically, uh, because being in QFN48, you don't have that many IOs. Um, it has DSP blocks, eight of them, so they are 16 by 16, and so you can do multiplication. Uh, so if you want to accelerate uh, accelerate some function, um, and it uh, it has uh, these are much smaller block RAMs, uh, but they're much more granular. They're only four kilobits, but they're dual port. Uh, so you have one read port and one write port. You don't have like dual read, dual write. Uh, there's like thirty of them. Uh, you know, for small FIFOs and stuff like that. And then you have the actual logic slice, right, uh, which is a four-lit-based architecture. They group by eight. Uh, you can use or not the flip-flops, and so you have classic LUT and the flip-flop. And uh, We'll see some more details later. Um, some other interesting features is the NVCM, which is a non-volatile configuration memory, so it can store its own bitstream internally. This is one-time programmable, so yeah. Um, apparently, some people tested it's more like, you know, three, four times programmable. <laughs> uh, so you can actually overwrite it a, a few times, but it's really not guaranteed uh, at all. Um, otherwise, it, it can just fetch its configuration from a normal SPI flash. And um, most of the, 
uh, pins that are used for configuration can be reused for user I/O after, which means that you can have the bitstream for your configuration and then some user data stored in the same flash and access it from from user, uh, basically. Um, that's the detail yeah, on the, the PLB structure. So you have some dedicated carry logic, which is really inflexible in the sense that, uh, you know, if you're familiar with Xilinx FPG and stuff like that, the carry logic is a bit more flexible and you can actually abuse it to implement something else than an actual carry logic for, uh, for an adder, in case you're not familiar with that. Um, here, yeah, really, you can implement an adder with it, and that, that's pretty much it. Um, then you have a forlet, uh, which is a lookup table. So you know, it provides any function depending on the, on four of the inputs, optional registers. Um, and what's important to note is that the they're grouped by eight, and the clock enable and set reset lines are actually shared by uh, the, those eight. Which means that if you have a flip flop that uses an enable, and that's the only flip flop that uses that particular enable signal, you, you just will sacrifice basically seven of the flip-flops for nothing uh, because you yeah you can't use them. Uh, something that's that I found really strange in that FPGA contrary to Xilinx is that the um, the set reset uh, here when it's configured in synchronous mode is actually gated by the clock enable. So if clock enable is at zero and you send a reset the flip-flop won't actually reset. Um, that's rather strange. That means that you have, uh, when you code your logic, you have all the advantages. You should basically use asynchronous resets, uh, else the synthesis tool will have no choice but to basically or your, uh, you know, do a logic or between your the reset and the uh, clock enable signal to generate the actual clock enable signal. So it's just a little detail, but uh, if you have a lot of uh, flip flops that are reset uh, with clock enables, it can drastically reduce your logic use and uh, improve your timing. Um, that's the board I've been working with mainly. Um, or I started with a, a board from you know Lattice. Uh, but they're rather limited, and this is a, a, a board that's becoming available, which is uh, really nice because when you have the UP5K, uh, you know itself, it has a two P modes, uh, three P modes, sorry, connector. Uh, so if you're not familiar, they're kind of a standard for extension. It's basically eight I/O and power uh, here, here, and here, um, and it has uh, the FTDI is used for programming the flash, and you can. Once the programming is done, um, you can actually use it to communicate with the host to send, receive data. Um, you can either use SPI or or UART to talk to the host, or, or both at once, actually. They use different pins. Um, you have a very large flash, uh, which is like 64 megabits, I think. And the, uh, the bitstream uses only one megabit. So if you want to put user data on there, um, that's very doable. Um, so something else about that FPGA is that it's supported by an open source tool chain, so you don't actually have to use any of the latest tools uh, if you don't want to. Um, you have Viosis, which uh, does the synthesis part. So for those, maybe I should have asked, who doesn't know what an FPGA is? Or? Oh. Doesn't know. Okay, good, because <laughs> I didn't explain, but yeah, whatever. So um, the flow in FPGA is, is often um, split in two tasks. The first one is called synthesis, which basically takes your very low code, uh, your, yeah, your whatever your um, HDL, uh, um, and converts it into um, logic elements that correspond to your FPGA family, and it's, that's what Weosis does. And it will generate a netlist with uh, you know, a series of LUTs and registers and stuff like that. And then the next step uh, is done by next PNR, and that's um, place and route, which is basically take those logic elements and actually decide where on the FPGA to place them and how to connect them using the available um, cells that are that are there and the available routing that are there. Um, and that's done by uh, by next PNR. Now uh, those tools are constantly improving, uh, but. If you're looking for the most extreme timings or stuff like that, the vendors tools still provide um, like an advantage. They, they're still uh, better, um, although the gap is, is closing rather fast with new algorithms and stuff like that. But yeah. Uh, so one nice thing about those 
FPGAs, you can overclock them, of course. Uh, so I noticed in the vendor tools that uh, you know you, when you simulate the timings to to know you know what what frequency will your uh, will your FPGA uh, reach, but you, you design what frequency can you r run it at, um, and you have to input you know what's your tolerance on the temperature? Like, do you want it to work from minus 20 to 85, or are you gonna be at a constant 25C? Um, how stable is your power rails? Like, uh, can it dip at uh, to one volt, or is it gonna be a consistent 1.2 volt? That kind of stuff. That has huge influence onto the, the results of the timing. And so I was wondering, um, okay, well, what's the actual speed like, <laughs> uh, instead of what's predicted? And so I did two tests. Uh, the first thing is to take the timing model that we use in the open source tools um, and kind of predict a frequency and then measure it. Um, and so I did that with a, a ring oscillator. So you basically, in the FPGA, you ask him to, uh, to do a chain of inverters. Um, and if you use an odd number of inverters, well, it will oscillate because, yeah, it constantly switch. Uh, and so you, using the timing model that you have, you predict how fast it's going to oscillate, and then you compare that with the frequency that you actually get. Uh, and that's this result. Like the timing model we have for the, the routing uh, logic and the, the, the logic element and the, the routing uh, predicted that it should oscillate at 11.1 .1 megahertz. Uh, when you actually measure it, it's 17.44. So there is definitely some margin there. And uh, the other thing is the dependency on the V core and temperature. Uh, I didn't actually test temperature yet, uh, although I didn't see a lot of variation there. But I mostly tested the uh, okay. Oh, if I it's nominal 1.2 volt, but what happens if I provide it with 1.1 and 1.3? That kind of stuff. Um, and so I used those two test boards. They're basically other boards that are meant for something else where I just populated the FPGA and didn't populate the uh, voltage, uh, the V-reg, uh, the V-core, sorry, regulator. And I just feed in a voltage from a, you know, external power supply, basically. That's for the LP384. That's, a, that's the smallest um, FPGA in that family. It comes in QFN32. Uh, it only has 384... Um, logic elements, which is, you know, really small, but it, yeah, you can still do very useful things with it. And that's for the uh, Ultra Plus 5K. Again, just the FPGA, basically, what's necessary to load a bit stream in it and, and manually feed the voltage. And that's the result I got. So basically, I, uh, I normalized the output frequency, which means at the nominal 1.2 volt uh, V core, you, you get one uh, normalized frequency. Uh, but you can see that uh, if you push it to 1.4 uh, volts, you almost get 50% uh, uh, faster frequency. Um, I also measured the power consumption. It's, it's not graphed, but uh, it's, uh, it's not significantly higher. Um, the heat is also not, I mean, I can't, it doesn't show up at all in the thermal camera. Like I couldn't see any difference between the board and the, the chip itself. So it's so so low power that it, the heat doesn't matter. Which means if you want to push your design a little bit, well, instead of putting a 1.2 volt vehicle regulator, you can put a 1.3 one, and it's just gonna go faster. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, you also have to be careful that if your voltage somehow dips, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna fall pretty pretty hard. The the current uh, timing model pretty much uh, are there. So that, that's basically, we simulated the, the worst case, basically, it's, it's, around, the, it's around here. Um, so uh, some, uh, some fun application to do with those. Uh, the first one is, basic, is a um, digital to analog converter using a PDM, also known as a Delta Sigma. Um, and this might look more complicated than the the, the standard uh, uh, delta sigma, but if you if you just go with the basics, you don't just take this pin. You just go through a resistor, well, two in series. That's just one, and then a capacitor. That's basically a low pass filter, right? And so you just output a, a density of pulses and you average them. That gives you an, an analog voltage. Uh, then you can add the second resistor here 
which, if you follow this relation, kind of gives you uh, more resolution bits. Um, the general idea is that uh, those three those three resistors they form a you know a resistive adder, and so you can have um, the first um, MSBs basically, which um, fix like a globally where you are on the voltage range and then use the uh, the LSB with a much higher resistance here to kind of tweak uh, that and get more resolution um, out of uh, out of your converter and so these would be these that's just the uh, output buffer um, and then there is this neat trick that I, I read about in some article uh, on the internet and so the problem, of course, of those kind of DAC is the output noise, right? Because every time you switch your I/O from low to low to high or something, you you tend to generate a, a, an edge. And even with the smoothing of the capacitor, it's just a, a simple LC filter. It doesn't filter uh, that much. Um, now, because it's delta sigma, you you try to push as much of your noise into the higher frequencies, uh, but still, it's not it's not perfect. And this. AC couples uh, the edges, but inverts them. This is the uh, this is the opposite of that of that bit, which means uh, it, it's kind of an active noise cancellation, uh, which actually works very well. Um, so that's the test board <laughs> uh, that I used to test this, and I fed that to a Roden Schwartz spectrum analyzer. Um, this is the noise output. Um, in a unipolar mode, so the uh, the two lower lines, inverted lines, are disabled, uh, and this is the output with the active noise cancellation. Which means, I mean, there's one peak that's still above the noise floor of the analyzer, but that's that's it. Uh, which I found was, you know, for a couple of more resistor and one capacitor, that's that's worth it. Um, especially since one of the application I'm using uh, this for is to tune uh, VCXO. Uh, and so I want a, a, as clean as possible output, basically. Um, another application, well, kind of the same board, uh, that's tracking the phase of a, a GPS PPS. So I'm assuming most people are familiar with the, you know, if you want to do a cheap GPS DO, you take any re GPS receiver, you take the PPS output, you take a 10 megahertz oscillator that you can tune, and then between two PPS, you count how many 10 megahertz cycles you got. If you got more than 10 million, well, then you tune your clock a little slower. If you get less, you tune it a little higher, right? But given it's based on PPS, uh, well, you get one pulse per second, which means you only get one measurement per second. Um, and so if you want to achieve very, um, a very fast transient response, but still, uh, uh, good precision. You, you, get, you, you have a trade-off there because you want you get 10 million cycles uh, every once uh, second. You can only get 100 ppb, um, kind of maximum uh, error detection. So you need to average over a lot of time, and and so your response is pretty slow. So one method to um, get more precise measurement is not only track the number of cycles you get, because hopefully you can get to 10 million exactly, but also track the phase of that PPS pulse versus your actual 10 megahertz uh, clock. And that gives you uh, more input to your uh, tracking loop. Um, and that's what this is designed to do. You basically get, uh, I should have put a yeah, like a timing diagram. Uh, but uh, uh, the general idea is that you take your 10 megahertz clock, you divide it by some number. I, I chose 8 because it's just easier to divide by 8 than by 10. But it doesn't matter. Um, and you track the phase of the PPS uh, to that. And the way you do this is this flip-flop is used as a, a phase comparator. And so when the PPS um, happens, the, since it's connected to the clock and the data is connected to one, this output will become high, and it will start charging that capacitor slowly. Uh, well, not actually not that slowly, but it, it will start charging that capacitor, and when the next uh, edge on that clock happens, which is the, what you're comparing the phase to, um, it will reset it, and so it will disable it. And so at that point, 
uh, because uh, those are inverted signal, the capacitor will start discharging. And so what you do is you have a, um, an, uh, a discharge resistor which is much higher than your charge resistor, and so that's basically a dual slope ADC. Um, you charge a capacitor pretty quickly to measure, to convert um, a time interval into a voltage, and then you discharge it much more slowly so that you convert back that voltage into a time interval, but which is multiplied into a much longer time interval. And then that longer time interval, you can measure it uh, using a counter and report that to, to the host to do, a, the, to do your phase measurement, basically. Um, that's the board that does that. Um, and so you get basically, I use the LP384 here because it's the smallest size for the FPGA. Uh, that's uh, the passives to do the dual slope ADC and this is the um, uh, pulse density modulator I presented before to control the uh, OCXO. And that's the uh, I squared C interface basically on those pins. That's the phase measurement. Uh, it's it's rather noisy, but um, it's um, those variations are actually a very very small uh, time interval when you scale them down, uh, and so it's not really a problem. Like a variation of one cycle of uh, of the 10 megahertz would be much much higher than this, and so it it even if it appears noisy, it's just because I'm using I don't. I'm using uh, yeah something I didn't uh, present here, but uh, um, to detect when the capacitor is fully discharged, this is a very low voltage, like 0 0.1 volt or something, um, and I'm using a differential input of the uh, FPGA as a comparator, which is not really designed to do that. And because the voltage slowed down really slowly, the the threshold isn't perfect, and so you get some noise. But it uh, in practice it it works fine. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, something else I did with uh, this FPGA is uh, implement a USB um, high speed, uh, sorry, full speed. <laughs> USB is confusing. Uh, and because USB uh, full speed is just CMOS 3.3 volt, right? It, they say it's differential, but in fact, it's just two independent I.O. that most of the time you toggle them one against the other, but not all the time. Uh, and so you can, the, the FPGA I.O. can drive that without an external phi. Um, that's the, the structure of the core. So you get basically the FPGA I.O. Uh, this layer deals with all the low level stuff of USB and I mean, really, really low level, like things like bit stuffing and stuff like that to ensure the appropriate number of transition. Um, then you've got the layer that actually creates and receives actual packets. Um, then this goes up to this, which is um, the transaction layer. So if you know a little bit about USB, um, the transaction layer, you get, you, you get a token from the host and then you have to reply within six, six bit uh, time with a packet of your own and then you, you're gonna get another one and that's uh, what's called the transaction layer but the response time is really fast. I guess it's six bit uh, time at uh, 12 megabits so that's not a lot of time. Uh, not enough for a CPU to respond and so this is uh, um, coded in logic but it's um, to be fairly flexible and be able to um, do it easily. It is actually coded as a microcode uh, state machine. So if you look in the source, um, you'll see actual opcodes, except those opcodes are really, really specific to USB. There's like an opcode that say, start the transmit of a packet or, uh, or compare the length of a packet, that kind of stuff, uh, really specific to USB. It only has like seven different opcodes, I think. But it can test, it, can, it basically implements, if you look at the USB spec, you'll find uh, like a state machine diagrams that implement the transaction. It basically implements that in, in microcode. Um, and yeah, it has a transmit and receive buffers for the different endpoints. Compared to some um, 
code that you would find in a microcontroller, because it's very similar to what you would find in an Atmel or something like that. Uh, it's basically what they call the SIE, the Serial Interface Engine or something. Um, the only difference is that usually in a SIE, you've got a fixed number of endpoints with fixed size buffer. Uh, this doesn't care. You can, uh, I think you can have 16 endpoints in USB, I think. Yeah. Uh, is it 16 or 32? I don't remember. I don't Whatever. I mean, if you want to, if, if you want to, exactly. Here, if you want to implement 16 endpoints in and 16 endpoints out, uh, you can you can assign the buffer independently to whatever endpoints with whatever either single buffered or dual buffered. And so, if you want to implement a, a like a 16 channel UART, you can do that with that. It doesn't matter. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have a full flexibility uh, there. If you want to implement control endpoint on something else than endpoint zero, you can also do that if you want. <laughs> I'm not sure who you're going to talk to, but whatever. Um, so some other fun application quickly. Um, my by DSI and talking to you know those uh, iPod screens. Um, that's a board to also talk to my by DSI, but larger size screens. I just I sorted it uh, not long ago. I haven't actually uh, tested it. I haven't even flashed a bit stream to it yet. Uh, so I don't know if it works, but it's at least designed to do that. Um, yeah, driving light panels. Um, that's uh, a re-implementation of a kind of a old school text mode that you would find in Commodore 64, stuff like that, uh, which is you know a, a text mode, but with programmable glyphs and palettes and stuff like that, except it drives um, display at a 1080p resolution and a 60 frame per second, but it's text mode because I don't have the RAM to put a frame buffer on there. Um, but you can still do fun stuff like re-implementing breakouts or uh, simulating like a graphical output uh, in text mode. Um, yeah, a few, a few links uh, to the documentation uh, from Lattice. It's not always super clear, but at least it exists, right? Um, the links to the tool chain, if you want to uh, install it and, and start working with them. A couple of very interesting uh, IC channel uh, that I definitely recommend. Um, and then a link to a uh, GitHub repo where I basically put all my IS40 um, stuff. And that's it. Any questions? I know it was quite fast and quite, I mean, I, 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 I just prepared a bunch of, uh, of stuff. I just really wanted to show a few applications and things you can do. But uh, if you want to talk to me about any sp particular application or, uh, or have uh, more details and stuff like that, uh, because, yeah, I know it was just pictures and me talking over them, basically. So, uh, yeah. Oh, we have a second microphone. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, um, so how many pins are there on the package? I so the, the, the package is 48 pins uh, for the UltraPress 5K, and I think you can use 38 of them as IOs. Some of them have some restriction. There's uh, three IOs which are kind of, um, they're meant to drive an RGB LED, so they are constant, uh, uh, constant current uh, sync, which you can actually program which current they, they run at. Uh, you can use them as normal I/O, but then they are uh, open drain. Um, mm. Yeah. And uh, I saw some DSP blocks on the diagram. Yes, you have Is eight of them. Is that of any use, like for channelizer? Yes, uh, I actually like have. Uh, I, I didn't show it there, but I actually have a P mod with a SX2057, uh, which is a, a LoRa. It's meant as a LoRa transceiver, but really you get just IQ data. What's interesting about it is that you get one bit IQ data, just highly oversampled one bit IQ data, and then you, can, you for transmit you have to use the delta sigma third order uh, to generate that one bit IQ, and for the receive side you basically take it, then uh, I run it through a CIC and then through an FIR filter to get lower bit rate, higher, uh, higher bit depth uh, I, um, RF, and I'm planning to use the um, DSP block to implement a FIR. So mm -hmm. even SDR might be... Yeah, I mean, it's low-rate uh, SDR, but I'm actually th 
this could actually implement like a GSM transceiver technically. Uh, because the, the, that, that SX 2057 does, uh, does run into the 900 megahertz band. And if I could, the only thing I'm missing is a 30.5 megahertz crystal or VCXO. Because that's, that's kind of the only rate that I, that I would have uh, that would be um, convenient to have the 278.833 uh, in GSM, uh, whatever. Yeah, we have a clock generator. Yeah, the, the, so the clock generator, the, I'm, I'm waiting for, for, for it, yeah. Well, you, you can have one. <laughs> Thank you.